If you listen to the Linux community online, you might think there isn't a single good operating system on the planet. Everyone seems to hate everything, uh, be it Windows, Mac OS, and uh, other Linux distros too. Tribalism in the Linux world is real, and honestly, it scares new users away because it just adds to the amount of noise and indecision that a newbie must face. It also doesn't cause a good first impression. Use Ubuntu! No, use Fedora! What? No way. Just start with Arch Linux. I'm Oscar, the super user, and today we're examining the main criticisms of different popular distros and talking about what I think. Of course, this is just my opinion. Everyone is entitled to their own, and if you generally hate or love some of the distros we're talking about today and you disagree, I have no beef with you. I still love you, dear viewer. I'll leave what I believe is the most hated distro for the end, but let's talk about probably the most famous one first. The Bloated Villain. And that would be Ubuntu. I've already covered Ubuntu in a previous video, which you can watch here. I also covered its main controversies, which stem from Canonical, the enterprise behind Ubuntu. Canonical, just like most businesses, wants to make money and oftentimes prioritizes their own profit over the comfort of their users. Canonical has tanked their reputation within the Linux community by adding Amazon results to the Dash, enabled by default, which raised privacy concerns, and also forcing the use of their own proprietary software store, the Snap Store. The affiliate link controversy happened in 2012 and was later removed, but these types of actions linger in users' memories for a long time. The Snap Package ordeal, however, continues to our days. Snap packages are another way of packaging and distributing software very similar to Flatpak. So what's the problem then? Snaps are open source tech, but the Snap store is centralized and controlled by Canonical. It is also forced upon Ubuntu's users and not everybody enjoys using Snap. You see, traditionally, Ubuntu has always used .deb packages and the apt package manager since it is based on Debian, which uses the same formats and tools. They are still in use by Ubuntu nowadays, but feel like a secondary install method. Ubuntu's App Center is Snap first, and it doesn't browse apt repo apps the way GNOME software does, and trying to use apt to install certain software like Firefox or Thunderbird is rewired to download the Snap package instead. This last bit feels dishonest, since the system is doing something you haven't told it to do, this leads to concerns of Canonical trying to impose their own proprietary format where they have absolute control and contributing to the fragmentation of different package systems on Linux. As if we didn't have enough formats yet. Lastly, a lot of people complain about the performance of Snap packages being slow, so it does have its downsides there too. So these are very valid concerns for a lot of people, but now, playing devil's advocate, I'm going to say that there are still many reasons why you'd want to use Ubuntu. It has a lot of money invested into it because of its corporate nature. It's reliable, has enhanced hardware support, live security kernel patching with Ubuntu Pro, which is free for home users. Uh, a lot of third-party Linux guides and vendor packages target Ubuntu LTS first. You can have a stable, unchanging system with LTS or a more up-to-date system thanks to interim releases. I'm going to say it, Ubuntu is excellent, and that's gonna hurt a lot of people, I know. It is still open source, so you can remove the Snap packages if you want. You can remove the Firefox and Thunderbird apt package switcheroo code. It's still Linux in the end. Ubuntu is kind of like the Windows of the Linux world, but with a less evil Microsoft. Now, I don't use Ubuntu anymore, I prefer other Ubuntu-based distros such as PopOS, but if you want that layer of assurance with a big company behind it, then Ubuntu is a great choice. Don't let anyone shame you for using it. The unstable beta test. This is Fedora. I've also covered Fedora in this video here, if you want to check it out. Now, Fedora also has corporate ties, but not as strong as Ubuntu with Canonical. Fedora is essentially a community distribution, but with heavy funding from Red Hat, a company owned by IBM and that develops Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or RHEL for short, which is an enterprise-grade operating system. 
The reason why Red Hat pour money into Fedora is because Fedora acts as a testing ground for all updates that go into RHEL. This draws two main criticisms, that Red Hat has a lot of power over the direction of Fedora and that Fedora users are treated like unpaid beta testers for a multi-billion dollar corporation. Because it's always chasing the latest and greatest tech, Fedora has a reputation for being a bit rough around the edges. Uh, this isn't to say it's completely unstable, but some users feel it has an alpha-like quality where you're more likely to run into bugs. Its aggressive six-month release cycle means you're getting major updates twice a year. For some, that's exciting, and for others, it's just exhausting. The frustrations don't stop there. People often complain that it doesn't ship with proprietary media codecs out of the box, thanks to its strict commitment to only free and open source software. This means one of the first things a new user has to do is go hunting for third-party repositories like RPM Fusion just to watch an H.264 video. Plus, some default settings can be annoying, like a firewall that blocks basic network sharing until you figure out how to change it yourself. But calling Fedora just a buggy beta test isn't the whole story. Those bleeding edge features mean it has some of the best hardware support you can find. It's also incredibly focused on security using tools like Cell Linux to create a more hardened system than many other distros. And for developers, having the newest kernels, libraries and tools for things like AI is a massive plus. I mean, it is the distro that Linus Torvalds uses, the creator of Linux, if you didn't know. For gamers, you get access to all the newest drivers, kernels and desktop environment updates, which translates to better performance. It sits in a sweet spot between the do-it-yourself style of Arch and the it-just-works approach of Ubuntu, offering a powerful system for anyone who doesn't want to put too much effort in setting up their system. So overall, Fedora is a fantastic choice as well. Now, I don't use Fedora nowadays either, but my experience with the distro has always been top-notch. Fedora is bleeding edge with training wheels. If you take the training wheels off completely, you get the Elite Guard. And that brings us to Arch Linux. If you've ever seen the phrase, I use Arch by the way, you already know the stereotype. Elitist, gatekeeping, and way too proud of using a difficult OS. The hate for Arch is often less about the system itself and more about the culture around it. The first wall you hit is the installation. There's no friendly graphical installer. You do it all from a command line, partitioning your own drives, setting up your network, and building your system one piece at a time. To its fans, this is the ultimate form of control and minimalism. To its critics, it's a pointless, complicated ritual designed to scare off anyone who isn't already a Linux expert. This perceived difficulty fuels the community's sometimes toxic reputation. The Arch forums are infamous for their read the frickin' manual or RTFM attitude, where newcomers asking for help are often just told to go do their own research. Now, nothing really wrong with educating people on how to find information, but sometimes it can feel a bit passive aggressive. That gatekeeping can be really intimidating and create a sense of superiority among some users who wear their Arch install like a badge of honor. And then there's the reality of a rolling release distro. Arch is always updating, giving you the newest software the second it's ready. While that's great for having the latest features, it also means an update can bring more bugs. There are no stable releases to fall back on. You are the system administrator and it's your job to pay attention and fix things when they go wrong. Now, the reward for all this work, of course, is total customization and control. You build the exact system you want with zero bloat and the Arch user repository or AUR is a giant community run library of scripts that lets you install almost any software imaginable. That power and flexibility is why its users love it so much, including myself. Arch is perfect for anybody who knows what they want out of their system. And the best bit is that you don't really have to interact with the community at all if you don't want to. The Arch Wiki is a fantastic resource and I often do not need community support at all. Luckily for many, there are other ways to harness Arch's power by using a distribution 
based on it, which makes installation and maintenance easy as pie. That leads us to the problem child, Manjaro, the distro that tried to make Arch easy and ended up getting hate from everyone. Its goal was noble, take the power of Arch and its massive Arch user repository, but wrap it in a simple installer and a user-friendly experience. So what went wrong? Well, it gets flack from both sides. Arch purists see it as a leech. To them, Manjaro profits from everything that Arch has built, but hardly ever contributes anything back. Some bugs in their graphical software manager, Pamac, have accidentally launched massive denial of service attacks on the Arch user repository in the past, taking it down for everyone. But the bigger issue comes from the other side, the promise of stability. To make things more stable than Arch, Manjaro holds back packages for extra testing. This, in principle, is good, but the problem is this delay can break things, especially with packages from the Arch user repository, which assumes you have the very latest Arch software. This puts users in a weird spot where a key feature of the Arch ecosystem, the AUR, becomes a minefield. On top of that, the project has a history of organizational mistakes that have damaged its reputation. This includes repeatedly letting its security certificates expire, a basic task in website maintenance that they have fumbled on multiple occasions. Uh, at one point, their official advice was to turn back your computer's clock to get around an expired certificate. A huge security no-no. Caught between two worlds, Manjaro can be too unpredictable for beginners who want stability and too distant from the Arch philosophy for Arch veterans. So yeah, Manjaro is harder to defend because some of the criticism isn't tribalism, it's track record. That said, it can still be perfectly usable if you treat it as its own distro different from Arch. And especially if you avoid mixing AUR packages into a system that deliberately delays Arch updates. Manjaro can work for people who want a polished Arch-like desktop and don't plan to lean on the AUR. In that sense, it's actually an excellent distribution, especially if you want up-to-date packages. Personally though, if I want an easy Arch, I'd rather go with Endeavor OS or better yet, Cache OS. That one is mm, chef's kiss. So it's pretty clear their hate is really just a side effect of people having strong opinions about what makes a good operating system. Every complaint is just the flip side of a feature someone else can't live without. Ubuntu's corporate polish comes at the cost of some control. Fedora's cutting edge tech comes with the risk of a few bugs. Archer's total freedom demands your total attention. The truth is, all the tribalism in the Linux world hides a simple fact. Most of these operating systems are fantastic. The debate isn't about which distro is trash, but about what you, the user, care about most. And this extends to macOS and yes, even Windows. So next time you see a flame war on Reddit or a forum, just remember that under all the anger and memes, there's a shared passion for building a better desktop. And that's something everyone, no matter their distro, can get behind. And just remember, as always, that with great power comes great responsibility.